We are very excited to be joined by I'm gonna I'm gonna call you legendary, the legendary John Don Johnson. I almost said your name wrong. Imagine just saying your John name wrong. Johnson. John Johnson. Uh, I'm thinking about that's the Brown safety was awful yeah. this weekend. Um, Don Johnson, how are you doing? How's it going? Going pretty damn good, actually. You've got a great. If if you're listening to this podcast, you need to pull it up on YouTube because your shoe matching with your sweater is. Gorgeous. outstanding it's a little bit fly isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's it is we're, we're going to talk about out, outfits and in, in some some swagger maybe in a little bit but we have to get to a movie revival first we have a lot to get to nash bridges yeah man that's got to be the fact that you're doing this right now in 2021 uh usa network november 27th movie revival that's got to be crazy it's it's like uh, my wife can't even believe it, and she was there for the whole damn thing. She, but she keeps walking up to me and going, can you believe that you you conceived this, wrote it, put it together, shot it, and it's coming out like right now? And I say, yeah, yeah, it took a lot of damn work. She says, didn't seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell maybe for someone who doesn't know Nash Bridges? We, we are, for example, our audience a little younger, a little younger audience, mid nineties, I would say probably average born. For those who may be too young, I mean, this is a revival from that era. Like, what can they expect with this? What is something that maybe they should look for here to get into this? Well, the first thing you should do is tune in to on Mondays. On uh, there's all day Nash Bridges. And there's 122 episodes you can familiarize yourself with the show. But it's my understanding that uh, some of your younger viewers have actually already discovered the show. And I get a lot of, um, uh, of uh, comments and you know social media comments about from, from younger people that are just addicted to the show. And um, so your, the beginning of your question was describe Nash Bridges – Somebody that maybe doesn't uh, doesn't know what it is. Nash Bridges is a well, it's basically a comedy that's in the four walls of a cop show, and uh, it stars Cheech Marin and myself and uh, a couple other folks you'll uh, you'll recognize. And then um, uh, it was on for six and a half seasons on CBS uh, many years ago, and uh, so I, we've revived it. Uh, because I, I just didn't think it was ever tidied up. I didn't think mm. it was it was finished off uh, uh, in the in the in the way it was supposed to be. So I started working on a script a couple of years ago, and um, um, I got a writer, uh, Bill Chase, who 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 threw in with me, and um, um, uh, we fooled around and came up with something that is. Not only as good, it may be a little bit better than Ooh. what was on the on the air originally, and that I might add was um, the 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 whole beginning of this show, and that your everybody will know this, I think, uh, was originally conceived. The show was originally conceived by Hunter S. Thompson and myself, mm -hmm. who was my neighbor in um, in uh, Colorado in Woody Creek, and. Um, so this is now kind of like full circle, like a, like, yeah. a, like a complete journey. You actually, I'm a, I'm a big Bravo fan, so I heard you say this on Watch What Happens Live once. Great appearances with Andy Cohen. But you mentioned they were, they were trying to pin you down on the normal song and dance, I'm sure, with Miami Vice. Or like, this was back when they were talking about the Vin Diesel one. But you made a comment that I remember you said you didn't you weren't like interested in revisiting Miami Vice because you, you left well enough alone. So you sort of already answered what I'm about to ask you, but... Is that the big difference with Nash Bridges? You felt like there was more to tidy up, where you would say that comment at Miami Vice. You're like, it kind of happened, like it it came and went. Yes, not as much of a need. Yeah, that uh, uh, all of that is true. Um, Miami Vice was of a very specific place and time, style and city, and to try and go back and replicate it would be, or or to, or or to bring it forward into the future. It just doesn't. It mm -hmm. doesn't work because our sensibilities, our 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 sense of art, our sense of television. Yeah. I mean, we we began, we changed the way that uh, that we contemporized television. I, w I won't say changed, but on Miami Vice, we contemporized television with Nash Bridges. I continued that uh, in terms of treating it more like a movie. 
in that there is a, a color palette and there were do's and don'ts and in, in in what you do and what you don't do on the show and uh, the and the the idea uh, of uh, of Nash Bridges was to was to make it about more about what my experience was in working with other cops mm -hmm. because they're funny they crack each other up all the time and when it comes time to get down to business they can they can throw down and they can get down with the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that's what I wanted Nash Bridges to be. And lo and behold, not only was it that way then, it's that way and kind of a little bit better because of the the changes and the millennials and all yep. the stuff that I get to play with now. So you and Cheech in that original run of Nash Bridges, you had done 120 odd episodes together. It's a long run. I mean, you guys had been now apart for what was it? 20 years now in this gap. What was it like reuniting with him and like rebuilding that chemistry? Honestly, it was like we went home for lunch for an hour <laughs> and came back. And, a long, good lunch. A, yeah. a long, yeah. good lunch. A good, a little nap after maybe. And, uh, and then we got back into it and, I mean, picked up right where we left off. It's crazy. I love that. Can't wait to watch that. That's one thing I think that people always resonate with with anything buddy cop is like they they really love and they have like a really good chemistry. And that's something that I think that you and Cheech had always had. Um, did you guys do like a chemistry read ahead of the original series airing where you were like, we have to make sure this works before we do any of that? And how did that go? Actually, uh, I was making Tin Cup with, right. uh, mm. with Kevin Costner. And Cheech was playing Costner's uh, caddy. Yeah, yep, that's in right. Tin wow. Cup. And at lunch on the very first day of shooting, because I had just finished uh, the script on uh, Nash Bridges, and at lunchtime, I, I, I took the script to Cheech and I said, okay, I want you to read this. And e everywhere <laughs> it says Dunnigan, because it's written for an Irish guy, right? <laughs> I said, everywhere it says Dunnigan, he goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, Dominguez. <laughs> and so that's that became his name. That is so Joe funny. Joe Dominguez. That's so cool. <laughs> Just right there on the set? During on the spot, right there. And I said, read that. And so after lunch, he came to me and he says, yeah, he says, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this. This is pretty good. Um, you know, I've got a commitment at... This was for CBS back then. He says, I've got a commitment at NBC. Oh, I've also got one at Fox. And I said, oh, yeah, we won't worry about any of that. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just go shoot this, and then we'll see what happens. And, of course, we ha ended up having to... Uh, you ended up having to Make cross friends. that bridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we made friends later. What, what if that? What if you'd not been there with him? Was there another idea? Like hypothetically, say you weren't on set at Tinka, but was there another idea in that sense, or just it just made sense with where you were at that time? I don't know, bro. I didn't get That's that. That's so far. funny. <laughs> I didn't get that far. I, I but when, the funny thing was, he was doing a scene with uh, Kevin, mm -hmm. and I'm going, "That's Joe. That's my guy." I love and, that. And uh, you know what scene it was? It was the scene outside the trailer. Uh, you know when mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Costner is up there uh, in his um, in his one room or a little solitude like, up on the like <laughs> so destitute desert area. <laughs> yeah. desert area yeah. in a golf course in fictitious golf course in um, driving range in Texas somewhere, and uh, they were up there and I was I was off camera and I was looking at him and, yeah that's it that's the way it goes. That's the chemistry. I love that. Um, what do you think it is about police stories that audiences always seem to identify with and like want to latch on to? Because I feel like not even just for general audiences, like for us, whenever like there's a police story, it's just so always fascinating. Why do you think there's just that, that fascination with audiences? I think that people are attracted to cop stories because they they are uh, they're they're about something, and they're the last line of defense. It's kind of life and death, it, all in one one area and. Uh, as as it relates to Nash Bridges, I I wanted to portray it more like I had seen it portrayed in real life. Cops are the most hilarious bunch of people you ever want to be around. They'll talk about dead people and and uh, shooting and stuff like that with such gallows humor that you can't imagine. But it's how they manage the stress of the job, and that's what I wanted Nash Bridges to be more like, as opposed to FBI or or um, yeah. CSI Miami. Mm -hmm. And not that those aren't great shows. Because they are great shows in their in their format. I just wanted Nash Bridges for you to be able to sit down, have a bowl of popcorn, have a right. great time, laugh a little bit, get caught up in a, an intense story, and then we'll see you next time. 
any any popcorn stuff. I just watched an interview very who said I think John Grzynski might have said that talking about making a quiet place. He's like, you know, sometimes you just got to make something that you can eat popcorn in front of that you can just enjoy that can have like something to it, but it's, yeah. it's there. It's there for pure enjoyment. Exactly right. Did you give uh, now this? This is I'm not sure many people know this, and we're going to tie it into something I really want to talk about. I'm going to I'm going to flash it up. Big Watchmen fans, mm-hmm. we got to talk about that. You, I, I think I got this right. You got Damon Lindelof his start with Nash Bridges? Yes. Because that's where he first started writing. Yes. And then he asked you to come read for well, he, he, Judd Crawford, right? He asked me. Well, no, I, I didn't read for him, but he, he wrote me the most loving, the most flattering, the most amazing letter that you can write to an actor. And after I finished reading the letter, I didn't even read anything. I said, <laughs> well... That is the most loving thing I've ever read, and you know, and you tell an actor how great he is, he'll follow you anywhere. And uh, so, so he, I went into his office. He told me basically what uh, what we were going to do, and I really didn't. I read the first uh, the first script. He didn't tell me anything about the backstory, and I kept asking. I said, Damon, what about the backstory? What a, there's, there must be a, a strong backstory here somewhere. And so I didn't know that Judd Crawford was Judd Crawford's grandfather was a big white supremacist <laughs> until the show aired. Really? Okay, because we were going to eventually ask you that. That's yeah. bait and switch you or something. You were, there, yeah. it, it, that was a full on bait and switch. <laughs> I'm still a little pissed off about it. <laughs> it it's it is the most. It's uh, so I think it's the greatest adaptation of a comic book in anything movies. T- like it is. I, I'm I can still feel like like the the goosebumps when they made the reveal of, you know, who was Dr. Man. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. So you experienced it the same way that. Oh we- yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was pissed off at him for a long time. <laughs> I told him I was pissed off. I was mad when your character died at the end of yeah, the episode. I remember, I was like, what we the messaged fuck? each other. We're like, what the fuck? He's dead. Well, <laughs> what happened was, I mean, and that was a big concern for HBO too. And for, for everybody, they were, they were like going, uh, you know, people love him. And <laughs> they love him in this part, and now we're killing him. What the hell? That's like um, I think we had interviewed uh, Ryan Phillippe for Big Sky, and then he died in like the op- the ending of the opening episode. And I was like, "What the fuck is happening here?" And that was like our sense, the same exact yeah. sense. We watched, we're like, "Oh, we didn't even realize like you were in it." And we're like, "Fuck, this is awesome." Is that why he didn't get? He doesn't have like a cameo in Nash Bridges. Just yeah, like, I got to hold this over you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I actually enjoyed the fact that I was coming. I was part of the joke mm-hmm. um, uh, where where I come in I set it up I make you believe one thing to be something else and I like challenges um, as an actor and as a storyteller I like challenges that that break the norms and that where because I think a lot of times in fact I know a lot of times I fight this tooth and nail is people get stuck in derivatives Oh, well, I know this works, so let's do it this mm. way. I've seen this this way before, so let's do it this way. The moment that I hear that, the moment I feel like that I'm doing something that I've seen done before, that's when I run completely the other way. Because if I'm not scared about what I'm doing, or if I'm not uh, – scared isn't the right word. If I'm not uh, – uh, Adventurous or – you know, Yeah, if I mm-hmm. don't feel that sense of, uh, of, of risk yeah. in what I'm doing, then I know it's wrong. Do you have your own, like, is part of it how open-ended, even the, I mean, look, the character is who he is, and you, his wife in the series is very much not a good person, but Judd at one point says, too, he's like, he said, you don't know me. Like, he makes that comment, like, is the character open-ended to you, and what's even your take on the end of the show? Because the show is, I mean, it's Damon Lindelof, so of course it's open-ended, which is why mm-hmm. I, yeah. he's a fucking genius, he's brilliant. Yeah. But do you yeah, have a take I, on kind of the, all the open-ended, especially with your own character? Um... Being just painfully honest with you, uh, I didn't see the ending, uh, I and I didn't read the ending uh, because I I knew that I was a part of something and that it didn't affect me one way or the other. And so yeah, and as you might imagine, I've got a lot of other things to do plus <laughs> several children. <laughs> I, I I applauded by myself in my own apartment at the ending. So that's mm-hmm. that's about as that's Good. that tells you it's just it was it, still I I can't get over. I think mean, we we talked about it at length. We did like mm-hmm. hour long breakdowns, and I I never I'd only seen the original movie. And I think same with with Ken Jack. And I ended up, I'm not even a reader. I was like, I got to go read this now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, yeah. 
Well, uh, th- you're a good man for reading it because it's uh, it's, <laughs> it's thick. It's it's yeah, dense. It's dense. <laughs> and, it's, and it, it's and, heavy too. Because when I yeah. got the job, you know, I said, "Oh, I'm going to get the book and read it." And Damon said, "Don't bother." <laughs> That's interesting. And the reason that he told me don't bother is because he basically took the inspiration yeah. for it out of the book and then blew it up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like a sequel, but also a rem. It's the it's 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 the whole thing is kind of like a circle, which is actually kind of the point of the entire show itself. Which is yeah. again, Damon Lindelof is, blows my mind. We had we had Tim Blake Nelson in right after. Mm-hmm. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So he he talked about yeah yeah, yeah Tim. same exact stuff. We had a nice time, Tim and I. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, quite the show. Another show. We're not again. We're not going to do the song and dance with you on Miami Vice. Are you going to return for reboot? We got to talk about fashion a little bit here. And if you came, you came <laughs> oh, fashionable. Yeah. Uh, what? It, you Graham Norton said to you, I think he said like you invented the '80s, which I love. I mean, you 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 have to you that has to be your you have to own that, right? Like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently, I mean, uh, I I don't particularly uh, uh, ascribe to that, but I'll accept. Is that the most comfortable clothing in the world? The so roomy and airy. It, it just looked. Great. That clothing became that that look became the look because we were we were all you know, uh, street guys, you know? And so we knew what was cool and what wasn't. Johnny Versace and, and Armani were just starting out. They didn't have big boutiques. They, they weren't uh, worldwide. They were literally just starting out. And so those guys and uh, um, Claude Montana and Alice B and Terry Mugler and all those guys were, were just all the hipsters in terms of fashion. So we sent... Uh, our costume designer to Milan to pull the outfits off of the models' backs as they came off the runway. And she would bring them back. And fortunately, Philip and I were our our model size, you know, so we'd just literally slip into the clothes and go wear them. <laughs> the look that was created by me was done out of the 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 need for to be cool to cool physically cool mm-hmm. yeah not not that to be to be you did both cool. it worked out yeah yeah it seemed to work <laughs> out but um, um, the the I I lost the belt immediately and the socks <laughs> and uh, uh, I cut the sleeves out of the t-shirt because it was just too damn hot and I pushed the sleeves up on the jackets because it was too damn hot. And you have to have the jackets on to hide the gun, mm-hmm. you know. So it was a, it was a form, it was minimalist underneath yeah, all that. Form, way more, function, exactly, you know? way more functional than you would might think in your head. It yeah, was like, and you know, and I used to laugh at people saying, "Well, it's style over uh, substance," and so it's not when you're there in August, brother. So you, you, they went to you sent people to Milan. I sent my own stylist, and I was even get it pulled up to the Macy's a block away. We do a trivia show mm-hmm. here, and the style of our trivia show is very Miami Vice. So I tried to replicate a little bit. I did the best I could. I had the white pants. It's here. not bad. It's. I, I did. I did okay. You did all right. Uh, the pocket square is a no-no. Uh, no, no. That's not that, functional. That, no that I blew that. The, I yeah. blew with the pocket square. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, po- the pocket square is a little. <laughs> it's the little white too, pants. A little too done. Okay. <laughs> you know, you got to remember, uh, Sonny Crockett was a cop who had been sleeping in those clothes for about <laughs> three or four days. It's very true. And there, again, there's no purpose they, to it. They, so they didn't go to a discount shoe store to get your shoes. Got it. That's Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. a note for next now, season. Now, on yeah. Nash Bridges, what I did with that show was uh, I was interested. Well, I was kind of looking at uh, Japanese anime. Really? Uh, yeah, at the Interesting. time. And, and, I, and, I, and I looked at San Francisco, and San Francisco is this kind of beigey, gray, monochromatic kind of city. Uh, uh, when you're in there, everything is kind of just that way. And so I, uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to make the elements, the lead elements, my main characters in the, in the piece, I'm going to make them medium-saturated colors. The yellow car, and if you recall, all of the characters in the show had very characteristic color combinations. And they were medium-saturated colors that would pop against the background, which makes my lead characters and the, the hero car stand out as the, as the main focus. And no matter where you were in San Francisco, you'd know who was in the show, who mm-hmm. was part of the show and who wasn't. 
I uh, love that. I was and hearing any anime thing. I know it gets Kenji. Yeah, that gets out. my blood flowing. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, uh, but I was walking at the, looking at some guest spots from Nash Bridges. I actually found one of you and Stone Cold. Stone Cold, what an outfit he had. And if you're on the video, we're putting this up on the screen. But he had a full jean jacket, jean pants, semi-Canadian tuxedo, <laughs> yeah. and a skater long sleeve t-shirt, too. And you got the vest, oversized uh, blazer, and the undersir too. Like, I mean, you guys yeah. had the fashion going on. Yeah, yeah. And we, well, for that time, that was uh, that was pretty slick. Yeah. For for Stone Cold, that's just standard wear. Yes, that's like his <laughs> regular... F- I mean, I, I, by the way, I love Steve. He's uh, He is a... He's a character, and he's a true brother. He he he'll have your back. He's a delight. Um, Never had you on for a wrestling cameo. Never had you. Yeah, good you on WWE. Nah, sometimes. I can't <laughs> ass, <you know? laughs> Love that. Uh, so just during the era of Miami Vice, I feel like there's either there's two ways to look at the pressure and also the fun of being what would be considered one of the just the coolest people in the country at the time. And I don't know where you would fall on it as far as that goes because like you were again. I would think of it as it's awesome. It'd be fun. Like everyone's like looking up to you. Like I want to look like this guy. I want to act like this guy. I want to be him. But also, there's a lot of pressure to that. I don't know which way you fell on it. You know, I, I'm, to be quite honest with you, um, I was so busy, and we were so focused on making the shows and the demand on our times because, you know, the the every you know at one time I think I. Uh, I was on the cover of literally every magazine that was on the newsstand. Um, and all of those magazine covers take time to shoot. The only time we had to shoot those were on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So we had no time. Yeah. No time. So it's hard to kind of have a 40,000 foot view of what's going on when you're in it. You're just in it, and every now and then you look up and you go, oh, this is going pretty good. All right, well, let's get back in here and do this some more. And uh, that's kind of where my head was at the time. And it was a good, healthy strategy, actually, to, to not, you know, get in and start believing your own press. and <laughs> yeah, Be press relatively and, insulated to that sort of world, right? Yeah. And, and you know, and the, the time is, it's when you got out of that bubble that you would, you would realize, oh, gosh, something's going on here. <laughs> yeah. you know? this, is, this is a little big, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is a little big. I, I knew we were in trouble when Philip and we went to the White House to meet the president. And God bless him, Philip Michael Thomas is not short on words or ideas <laughs> or on, on grandiosity. And uh, he said, he said, in an interview with the Washington Post that morning, while we and that he had before we went to the White House, oh yeah, man, we're bigger than the Beatles. <laughs> and I looked at, I saw it, and I looked at him at breakfast, and I went, "Dude, <laughs> you can think that, you can't say, say it." it. Yeah, that is, is that one of like that? It might be the all time. You can't say that out loud. Yeah, yeah. you can't say that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God, that's amazing! I love how you mentioned, by the way, that you, that you kind of got the the Cheech involvement into Nash Bridges through Tin Cup because that's a movie we very much like. But there has always been something in Tin Cup that has always bothered me, and it is the fact that I think the fact that Rene Russo didn't pick you and pick Costner is crazy to me because, and it's crazy to me too for many reasons. And I'm going to tell you another reason <laughs> soon. But go ahead. Uh, uh, here's the thing: like the more I think about the two characters, yours is and Kevin Costner's, you were the better golfer. You were nicer. You were richer and you were more handsome. Why would she ever pick Costner in this case between him, you and him? Psychiatrist. <laughs> it's, the only, it's the only thing that you, you can blame it on. I'm going to tell you a funny story. When I was dating Melanie the first time, I was like 20 years old. And she was like 15 or 16 or something like 15, I think it was. And, um, and we were just all kids in Hollywood, but I had a driver's license. And she was going to her modeling gigs. So I used to drive Rene Rousseau. Rita Wilson, who's married to Tom Hanks, mm-hmm. and Melanie to their their modeling gigs in my beat up old Chevy, <laughs> way back when. And so when we were on Ten Cup, I said, "Well, are we going to consummate or what?" <laughs> <laughs> that's like a serious. That's like a little Rat Pack yeah, for I real. Couldn't, couldn't really talk her into that. <laughs> the uh, with with Ten Cup. Another question I was had because I always found golf to be relatively boring growing up because I grew up very lower class and just we did not get into golf at all and i my question for you as someone that has been in one of the major biggest golf movies ever is just is golf boring because i know that you're a guy that has also been involved you know in you race power boats and that to me is like the antithesis of the excitement level of golf so where do you fall on it 
Well, <laughs> uh, I, by the way, I grew up a lot like, uh, like you. I grew up poor, and I, I saw people out on the golf course, and I thought that's the stupidest sport I've, <laughs> yeah. ever, I've ever seen. I don't understand it. Why would anybody want to go out and spend? Anyway, uh, obviously, um, and I started playing golf with uh, my buddy Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers Band because we were both trying to stop drinking. And so we thought we'd, you know, spend four hours on a golf course would be a great place to stop drinking. Yeah, that worked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about the sport that drives you to we drink. Until we got to the <laughs> 19th hole. And then we realized that that's where the drinking began. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I, start, I came to golf late in life, and then I got addicted to it. And, I mean, I couldn't play it enough. And... Um, now I'm on the I'm on the good side. I'm on the healthy side where I play it now. I don't give a shit how I play, and I, I'm just really particular about who I play with. Mm, there you go, good that, team. As a, as a, I my dad's been in the golf business his whole life. So I'm the opposite. Like my dad's worked in the industry. Like I've played golf since I could walk. One day I'll reach that level where I don't care. Every day I'm like, this is the time I don't care anymore. And then I am, and I'm like, why do I do this? It, why do I do this to myself? It might not be in the cards for you. <laughs> it, it may no. be in your DNA. Yeah, yeah, it may be. Uh, reminder, Nash Bridges, USA Network, November 27th. Cannot wait. I want to ask you about, I love when we have anyone in here who's worked with some of our all-time directors, Quentin Tarantino. I just watched something on him like two days ago where he was talking about his style, his directing, and he talked about thinking like an actor. I'm curious from your end, in a very intense movie in Django, he said, don't be intimidated by your actors. You're there to find it together with them and said that his big thing is he said every director should be sitting right by the camera, not by a monitor, not in some other room, not what, like right in front of the camera so it's like they're acting to you. Do you see that with his... 100%. 100%. 100%. You know who else? You know who else did that? Sidney Lumet. Would who stand. is his that's his biggest I think inspiration, right? right yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Sidney Lumet would stand right by the camera and I, I made a movie with him one time and and I was right in the middle of this intense scene where I have a butcher knife and I'm just swinging it around and everything and Sidney is acting the scene with me off camera. So much so that I st- had to stop and say Sidney just take two steps back out of the light <laughs> so I can't see you in my my uh, periphery. Uh, Quentin is uh, very much, I mean, he, he is there, uh, and finding it together is exactly what, uh, what he does with you, you know, and he gives you all the room in the world to play around the character and to, to uh, improvise and to do some things, but he's very specific about his dialogue. Like, he'll let you do it your way a hundred times, but you're going to do it his way at least once. <laughs> and, and I got used to that because I'm, I, I like it when there are, when there are boundaries because it makes, you, it makes you do the right thing as an actor. Mm-hmm. It makes you dig deep and be focused and come from a, from a, 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 from a place of authenticity and origin. Is that a thing that's happened lately with, like, you know, all visual, like green screens, where people, you see more directors not right there? I think it's, you know, I think a lot of things have happened. I think that there's a lot of collaborations going on between writers and directors. And um, and I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying that when a writer-director are co- collaborating, they tend to collaborate around the frame, around mm-hmm. the monitor, so that they can comment on... You know, the writer will say, well, when I here's what I was thinking. Or the director might turn to the, the writer and say, is this kind of what you had in mind? He'll go, it's exactly, it's better than what I had in mind, you know. And so there's a lot of that. And then there's also a lot of people, a lot of actors, and I think this is not so good, who like to see playback mm-hmm. on their performance. And I don't care who you are. Um, there's a quote by Mark Twain who tried to write his own autobiography like three times, four times, and failed at it. He says, I defy any man to write his own uh, autobiography and not go in and edit after he's finished a writing session yeah. each time. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and, and that's true with actors, I think, in watching their performance. Because watching your performance, you're looking at something that... you, you Actors get... 
spun out on you know on how a, a, a wrinkle is or or I wish I'd smiled more or I wish I'd done this or I wish I'd done that and the 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 truth of the matter is the less involved you are in the outcome the better the outcome mm-hmm. it's yeah. like when you focus it's on not dropping said. something you're just 100% more likely 100% to drop it. drop it exactly yeah. yeah just how it works um is it like a bit of a roller coaster for you as far as like you get approached by a top tier director like Quentin Tarantino like oh shit this is awesome this is so cool and he's like yeah man i think you'd be perfect as like a plantation owning slave owner like you're just great for this role is that like oh this is great oh what the fuck why are you want me for this <laughs> well <laughs> I'll tell you what's funny. Um, uh, I don't know if Quentin's ever told this story, but I was that I was actually supposed to play uh, Leo DiCaprio's part. Okay, Candy, yeah. And um, what happened was is that Will Smith was originally supposed to play Django, right? And when Will Smith fell out, the the uh, financing felt like that they needed two names. To instead of just because they were going to open it with Will Smith and uh, Christoph Waltz, and that was and then I would play the 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 Leo DiCaprio part, and um, then when he fell out, they needed another name for the box office part of it, and and uh, and Quentin came to me and he was very honest. He said, "Listen, I'm going to write a, a a part for you, and you're really going to love it, uh, but I got to do this, and it's for this reason." I said, "I don't care. Look, I just want to work with you, so yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me." And lo and behold, he conceived and and conjured up and spun out Big Daddy. Probably yep. people's favorite part of that whole entire saga of that part of the movie is probably the part with the people brothers. Love the most. Yeah, yeah, the, that's what um, I hear that a lot, you know, and uh, and Jonah, I loved it. Jonah Hill. Yeah, I, I, I loved it. Uh, oh, that scene is so funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Um, one last thing. You were in one of our favorite movies of the previous couple years in Knives Out. The one line that you had, I think, is considered one of the funniest that people brought away from it. The immigrants who get the job done, Hamilton reference. People die from that. Can you just please tell me that it was ad-libbed? Because that's such a beautiful moment. Um, actually, it wasn't ad-libbed. It was a written line, and but I loved it. So I was said, okay, the the the... The best way for me to play this is to play it like I'm ad libbing it, mm-hmm. honestly. And it worked that way, yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's so easy to sometimes just lean on those because you know it's going to be funny. And um, but um, but that one I was actually <laughs> disciplined enough to pull it off. <laughs> Caught it at the public. I just that the whole scene just kills me. It's so funny. Uh, thank you so much. Anytime you're in New York, with I mean, I could mm-hmm. I have a billion more things I'd love to ask you, but we'll we'll. We'll, let, we'll, let, we'll release you for now. Well, this is a good. This has been a good time. I, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Course, it's thank been you. an We're honor. USA Network. Nash Bridges. Yep. November twenty seventh. Nash, Nash Bridges. Bridges. You guys Crazy. are going to have a blast. I cannot wait. And now mm-hmm. that I know this, and now we know it's inspired by anime. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole different. There's anime inspiration. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. Our audience is going to love just hearing that. Well, mm-hmm. that was the that was in the original. We'll see what the, this one turns out. <laughs> to be. But um, anyway, I enjoyed myself. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Yeah, course, no, thank appreciate you so much. It.